I'm Gabriela Fresquez, and this is Radar 2020. As a second-generation Latina raised in the U.S. by a Mexican immigrant mother and a Tex-Mex Chicano father, I didn't feel accepted by either culture growing up. I was too Americanized for my Mexican family, but Mexican enough for my classmates to call me Beaner. Joke's on you, Tommy Miller. My mom's frijoles were bomb. All you ever had were Lunchables. That's not even real meat. I was also Mexican enough for my sixth grade teacher to constantly mispronounce my name. Dear white teachers, and teachers of all colors for that matter, please learn to pronounce the names of your black and brown students correctly. You know, names like Florangel, Curvin, Fatimata Binta, Elvin, Anabelis. Yeah, those names. But as different as I might have felt growing up, my experience wasn't that unique because one million U.S.-born Latinxes will turn 18 this year alone, all from a variety of different cultures, each with their own customs, comida, and spice level preference. Don't ever trust a Mexican with that, by the way. You've been warned. So this is my fiance, Bayardo de Morgia, also Mexican. So, Mayardo, uh, I like spicy foods, but I feel like you're you're a little more into spicy foods than I am, I am. right? Can you kind of walk us through all the different spice levels that yeah. we have? Yeah, so at our disposal? here we have a wonderful Cholula sauce. Um, okay. Spice level will probably be maybe a Dora the Explorer. You know, it's like all right. getting so, you there. Um, kind of like your starter Over spice. here, tomatillo sauce, okay. I would say spice level Becky G. Has a lot of flavor, a little bit of spice there, she's good. Um, and then this one is going to be like a habanero type sauce, which is like a Salma Hayek on the spice level. It's pretty spicy. Yeah, pretty yeah. spicy. And if you really want to get some street cred, you have some jalapenos here. Um, the trick is to have the seeds in them, you know, so you can really challenge yourself and you just pop it in. Oh yeah? Mm -hmm. You're going to show off like that? All right, I'm going to get one with seeds and I'm just going to, I'm going to put it in my taco. Yeah, okay. All right. You, you're not, you can't tell me that your tongue isn't on fire right now. Right, he's lying. He's straight up lying. I think we're gonna need some milk. <laughs> Point is, a diverse Latinx population in the U.S. is booming, and biculturalism is becoming the rule rather than the exception. And the majority of us are, to some degree, bilingual. Spanglish counts, right? Ugh, my fluency with Spanish is not the best. I can understand more than I can speak, but I stopped speaking Spanish when I was five, so my vocabulary is pretty stunted. Anytime I went to the movies with my parents, they'd interrupt like every five minutes, like, hey, what does that word mean? And uh, you'd have to translate, so you can't really watch a movie in peace. It really triggers something in me because it's just that frustration of like, man, that was my first language. And now I am like grasping at the words and trying to figure out how to express what I want to say. Sometimes I'll speak, I'll be speaking in Spanish and translating it into English in my head even when I don't need to. I think the future is going to be Spanglish as Spanglish. And if being bilingual sounds challenging, yeah. how about being tricultural. This is my amazing grandmother. Mm -hmm. Love you so much. You are going to teach me how to make oroca con dulce, Puerto Rican rice. You could only teach me in Spanish. How do you think I'm going to do? Good. Is there one culture versus another that you feel more connected to and in what way? Why are you gonna put me in this position? I got to. Why, why are you gonna, you know, my, I got both grandmas still alive and kicking. They're gonna watch this video. They're gonna come after me. Uh, <laughs> man, that's hard. Okay. I look very much like my father. Like, I'm Afro Latino. My, my whole Puerto Rican side is very dark complexed. We got Afros, curls popping, melon and popping with everything. My Mexican grandmother moved out of state when I was like five. So I always felt like more connected to my Puerto Rican side creating content right now and, and these platforms, we can kind of speak out on, you know, why we feel this way. I love my Mexican side. Mexican grandma, please, if you're watching this, I love I love, I love, my Mexican side. But yeah, I think, I think Puerto Rican, yeah. I'm the guy that's like, just saying, you know, there's no such thing as not being Latino enough. Like, but still diving into the culture. Like, like I can't dance salsa. I'm a terrible dancer. 
I, I don't like cilantro. It tastes like soap to me. It's genetic, people. Okay, don't hate, don't, don't hate me. And yeah, it's like, I, I'm not great at Spanish. And it's, that was just plagued me my entire life where I didn't even feel like I could join Pedro. Like, I thought like, because I wasn't Latino enough, it took a lot of work and confidence to build that up. And say, you know, telling myself and believing that, you know, Latino is not something that you try to be, it's just what you are. As a Mexican-American, I was raised on pozole and pan dulce, saying las mañanitas instead of happy birthday, and had parents who relied a little too heavily on sana sana colita de rana rather than seeking actual medical attention. And even if you're not Latinx, you're probably still familiar with Mexican culture, like the food, the mariachi music, holidays like Day of the Dead or Cinco de Mayo, and La Reina de Tejano music herself, Selena. And that's because Mexicans make up more than 60% of the US-based Latinx population, which makes sense considering most of the Western United States used to be Mexico. Even the best and brightest among us mistake the birthplace of Frida Kahlo for being its very own continent. Geography is hard. But Mexican culture is heavily influenced by region. Take Texas Mexicans versus California Mexicans, for example. As a California Tex-Mex hybrid myself, the most significant differentiator between the two can be summed up by a battle that has waged on for generations, revolving around the very controversial culinary cornerstone, tortillas. Cali Mexicans say that a taco can only be made with corn tortillas because using a flour tortilla would make it a burrito, while Tex-Mexers use the two interchangeably, calling them both tacos. What kind of tortillas do you guys like? Corn. corn. Is that like, it has to be corn? Yes, yeah. it tastes better with the salsa. Corn with tacos and flour with everything else. Do you feel identified with your Mexican roots? Uh, yeah. I go to like my family parties and they wear like the Mexican boots and hats and stuff, so I feel cultured enough. <laughs> Bueno, personalmente me gustan las tortillas que es blandita, la de harina. ¿no? A, mí, a mí personalmente me gusta mucho la tortilla de harina hecha a mano. Salen más ricas, más blanditas. Me gustan así recién hechecitas a mano, con poquita sal, así y luego con aguacate. Con aguacate. ¿Y tortillas de maíz o tortillas de harina? Tortillas de maíz. Tortillas de maíz. Tortillas de harina, no tanto, más las de maíz. I've got to go bipartisan on this one. As long as the contents inside the tortilla are delicious, I'm good. Extremism is destroying America, you guys. And as a West Coast Mexican-American transplant currently living on the East Coast, over here, Latinx culture looks and sounds different. You know, Cubans, I found out Cubans, you guys speak Spanish, like everything means something. It's very serious. You ask a Cuban a question, bro, where are you going? <laughs> Why you wanna know? <laughs> Just asking, dude. <laughs> it's like, why is he yelling? I don't know, I don't know. And I found out Puerto Ricans, you guys speak Spanish like there's a time limit. <laughs> Ask a question, hey bro, what's up? Mira, bro, el otro día estaba cojito, me estaba platicando que chacha vinito, yo no sé lo que estaba pasando, aquí no vas a poner. Dame más gasolina! Just... Fast! The vibrancy of Latinx culture on the East Coast, especially in places like South Florida or New York City, is amazing and reflective of just how diverse we are. Living in Miami, I just discovered arepas six months ago, which are Colombian, unless you ask a Venezuelan. And if you ask which country's arepa is better, make sure to note all of the emergency exits in your direct vicinity because you might incite bloodshed. Our efforts to distinguish our cultures from one another can get a little heated. ¿Qué es más rico que un mango? No hay nada en el mundo. Este mofongo sabe brutal. ¿Qué hay más mejor que una presidente vestida de novia? Nada. No hay nada mejor que una medalla fría para el calor este que hace. Tell me what it's like to live in a city where almost half of the population is Latinx, but where Puerto Rican, Caribbean culture is not that prevalent. We get more of the Central American, more of the Mexican side, the Salvadorian which are both like beautiful cultures, but they're most of the time very different. When you say you're Puerto Rican, one of the first things they ask is, so where do you have your Puerto Rican flag? Is it in your car? Is it in a sticker? Is it in your, in your mug? <laughs> and that is kind of like a little bit of a stereotype, but also like not really. Mira para allá, vamos, mira. Boom. I think in the past, our Puerto Rican accent was 
frowned upon. I think a lot of people have reclaimed their accent. So tell me how you have reclaimed your accent or your Boricuanes. For when I started at BuzzFeed, I would try to kind of like deboricuaize de myself. Like, I don't even know how you say that. I remember years ago, I would try to like articulate every single word in Spanish, all the S's that Boricuas never pronounce. That kind of like damaged a little bit my content at the beginning. But I've learned along the way to just let let myself be. I'm speaking from the heart, from my experience that I lived. I'm not trying to be anyone. And me speaking very hella Puerto Rican, y comiéndome toda la S y la R y decir así como me salga, that is gonna make my content be more genuine, more, more authentic. What do you want people to know about our culture? The amount of times that I meet someone in Los Angeles from Puerto Rico and a week later I'm at their house like having dinner just because we were Puerto Ricans and, and we clicked immediately. Every time there's a party, the Puerto Ricans are the first one on the dance floor. That is something that speaks a lot about our culture, of how inviting we are, how caring and warm and, and, and just super friendly. That's kind of what I would love for everyone to know is how cool Puerto Ricans are. Our culture is delicious, like everything. As the package, wow. But whether you're walking down Calle Ocho, the Bronx, or Spanish Harlem, the influence of Central and South American and Caribbean culture is everywhere. Even though there's a lot of crossover within Latinx culture, the more you're exposed to the versatility of Latin American identity, the more it makes the idea of lumping us all into one category kinda absurd. There are so many options out here to go eat, it's not even funny. I love the Salvadoran Tex-Mex restaurants. I love the pupuserias. I love the Honduran and Guatemalan spots. My name is Jose Centeno Melendez, and I am a historian. Jose studies Latinx history of the DC area. In the 1950s and the 1960s, there were large waves of Cuban immigrants, uh, Dominican immigrants, uh, South Americans, really folks from all over the Western Hemisphere. By the 1980s, the U.S. was backing a 12, what ended up being a 12-year-long civil war. You also see the arrival, the unprecedented arrival of tens of thousands of Salvadorans coming here to Columbia Heights, coming to Adams Morgan and Mount Pleasant, precisely because of the war. Today, Salvadorans are the largest immigrant group in the nation's capital and around 200,000 Salvadorans live in DC, Virginia, or Maryland. Being Salvadoran in this part of the country means being uh, meshed within a hyper-diverse community, just a host of diaspora communities that have also made DC and the, and the DMV at large home. The DC area is home to the largest group of Bolivian immigrants in the US. It's also home to a large number of Honduran and Guatemalan immigrants. The neighborhoods known as Columbia Heights, Mount Pleasant, and Adams Morgan at one point in time were really known as the Latin Quarter. But with a lot of redevelopment changes, it started to really morph into spaces that had luxury apartments that really only an upper middle class uh, family could afford. Gentrification has pushed the Latinx community into Maryland and Virginia. But Jose insists that Latinx have left their mark on the city. Some of the most easily identifiable distinctions among Latinx cultures are la comida y la música because what else is there to life really? The answer is nothing. Salsa music is probably the most recognizable genre of Latinx music in the United States. Think about it. Anytime you're watching an American movie and a token Latinx person appears on screen, note the background music. Spoiler, it's always salsa. We eat it, we dance it, and multiple countries love to claim ownership of it. But the one true birthplace of salsa is Cuba. Esa fusión de música española con la música africana en las cuales eh, había mucho toque de tambor, mucho drum, eh, muchas voces altas, pues dieron orígenes a lo que fue más tarde el son cubano, la guaracha. Nosotros traímos esa influencia del son cubano y los boricuas, los puertorriqueños, adaptaron a su música que era muy parecida a la nuestra. Hicimos esa fusión en la cual comercialmente se le puso salsa. 
also known as the ultimate litmus test for whether or not your gringo boyfriend can hang at your Mexican family gatherings. Where, where would my hands go for this proper dance we got? No lower than that. No lower than that. You don't know <laughs> timing. Me. Okay. It's quick, 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 slow. quick, 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 slow. And good luck getting with a Colombiana because Colombian salsa is a whole other beast, known for fast-paced, intricate footwork, intimidating to say the least, and likely cause for you to reevaluate your relationship altogether. As for this grito, it's almost as recognizable as salsa. It's the cue for Mexican mariachi that sounds like the cross between a laugh and a cry, or something your parents might do to humiliate you at your fifth grade birthday party to signify there was something other than rice water in their horchata. But the versatility of music in Mexico can't be understated. From rock in Espanol to pop artists like Rebelde and Paulina Rubio. And speaking of Mexican pop, remember when a Puerto Rican played a Mexican-American Tejano singer and Mexicans totally freaked out and then she became J-Lo and now Puerto Ricans have bragging rights for life? <laughs> To be fair, Puerto Rico has given us a lot more than just J-Lo or Ricky Martin. Puerto Rico is where reggaeton and Daddy Yankee exploded. But reggaeton and plena also have roots in Panama, with artists like El General paving the way for mainstream artists of today like Bad Bunny or Carol G. And the genre has come a long way, even surviving being banned from events in cities across Latin America for being too aggressive and sexually explicit. You know, everything that makes it fun. Bachata music in the Dominican Republic has a similar legacy of surviving hate from elitists. So naturally, it's still extremely popular today, with Spanish, indigenous, and African musical elements, lyrics ripe with heartbreak and passion. It's basically the ultimate emo music of Latin America. Merengue, on the other hand, is a more traditional style of Dominican music, what your older, more conservative parents might dance to, then you have the super traditional music of Latin America, folklorico, or folk music, from Palo de Mayo in Nicaragua, Punta in Honduras, Venezuela in Joropo, Brazilian samba, and Cuban guaguancó. That is absolutely an objectively funny word to say and impossible to do so with a straight face. Guaguancó, guaguancó. Yeah, I'm never going to pronounce it right. It's guaguancó. Okay. And if you think we're passionate about our music, you've never heard us talk about food. The mal season is right around the corner, and y'all better be ready for it. If you're from the Caribbean, you might call them pasteles and use plantain. But if you use corn for the dough, South Americans might know them as ayacas. If you're from Mexico or Central America, pásale, pásale, si hay tamales, si hay tamales. they're typically known as tamales or nacatamales. You might even have very strong opinions about whether they should be wrapped with banana leaves versus corn husks, or whether they taste better steamed versus boiled. The consensus, though, is that everyone's mom and or grandmother makes the best kind. Here in the U.S., stereotypes about the Latinx community have been upheld for generations. Through political propaganda, the news, and in TV and film, resulting in limited perceptions of Latinx identity. Growing up, I feel like a lot of people would ask me that mean girls question, like, if you're Mexican, why are you white? People automatically think brown equals Latino, but you realize, like, hey, there's different shades, there's different shapes, there's different colors. We all have different types of hair, as you can see. We're typically stereotyped into these, like, characters in media that um, don't go past like the over sexualized Latina but then on the other spectrum like you have like the maid in the movies at the same time like I said I'm not necessarily offended when I see a housekeeper on TV I mean there's like I said my mom did that when you tell someone they don't look Latinx you sound uninformed because Latinxes constitute an ethnic community not a race. And because of colonization and the African diaspora, we make up an incredibly broad spectrum of melanated and not so melanated people. Another myth about Latinx culture is rooted in the idea that Spanish is a foreign language. Not only was it the first widely spoken European language in the US, it varies greatly among those of us who speak it. Pimentón. Pimiento. Mazorca. Mazorca. Elote. <laughs> It's una guagua. Una guagua es un bebé. Autobús. Bus. Yo le diría camión. 
Dependiendo del tipo de guagua, esa podría haber sido una voladora. La reina pepiada se hace con aguacate. El guacamole se hace con aguacate. El aguacate es de México. Falta. ¿Cómo? Popcorn. Crispetas. Ok, le voy a decir, pero yo no me lo inventé, ¿ok? Cocaleca. Eso es cocaleca. ¿Coqui? Palomitas de maíz o cabritas. Depende de dónde eres. Palomitas. Cotufas. <risa> Habichuela. Habichuelas. Frijoles. Frijoles y son mexicanos. Poroto. Caraote. No, 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 no. ¿Qué están haciendo en Venezuela? Yo creo que decían una religión. Eso no. Vamos a inventarnos palabras nuevas. Eso es un guineo. Eso son guineos. Eso es un plátano. Plátano. Tambur. Ese también se lo inventaron en Venezuela. Y no sé qué se están metiendo porque entre las cotufas y el tambur. Sorbeto. Calimete. Calimete, no, no digas calimete. No digas calimete ya porque te lo van a malinterpretar. Popote. Pitillo. Bombilla. Bombilla. Yeah. ¿Y cómo le dicen a los bombillos? Bombilla. Y para mí un pitillo, para que te explico. Enchulado. Está aficiado. Enyehuecido. ¿Cómo, cómo? Enyehuecido. Estás empepado, empepado, tragado, enamorado, bobo. Enculado, está enculadísimo de mí. Perísimo o chulísimo. Bacano. Bacano o chimba. Arrechísimo. Muy chingón. Padrísimo. Ah, me encanta decir padrísimo. Brutal. Even musicians who are constantly touring throughout Latin America have a hard time imitating each other's accents. Che, pues che, un boludo. Che, boludo, tú, tú como que traes una mala vibra. Canta la pizza. La y te canta el jugo de... Pomelo. Que la que hay, papi. Yo quiero un poquito de mojongo. Aquí estamos en el caserío, loco. Estamos bregando. Estamos bregando. ¿Qué onda, güey? Órale, güey. ¿Qué onda, güey? Órale, güey. ¿Qué onda, güey? No, eso de güey no es cierto. Es así como estoy hablando yo. Lo que pasa es que todo el mundo se imita muy mal. Nadie sabe hacer el acento mexicano, la verdad. Note the subtitles, because not all Latinxes speak Spanish, not all of us have even been to Latin America, and not all of us are Mexican. And while we don't yet know the results of the 2020 census, we do know that Latinxes account for more than half of the U.S. population growth in the last decade. Also, painting U.S. Latinxes from 33 distinct Latin American cultures with a broad brush is not only impractical, but apparently it won't get you reelected either. I'm Gabriela Fresquez for Radar 2020, soon to be Radar 2021. Thanks for watching Radar 2020. Please like, subscribe, and comment down below, and let us know what issues are important to you. But only the important ones, because the frivolous ones are like so 2019. <laughs>